This is The Fifth Estate, a conversation between young African scholars from the Fort Hall School of Government and Professor Mutahin Gunyi. This Sunday, we refuse to comment on the Court of Appeal ruling against IABC. It is not important. However, we wish to echo a worrying trend highlighted by Prof. Gidu Muigai in his submissions to this court. He said something to the effect that a distorted theory of justice is beginning to emerge in Kenya. In this theory, the administration of justice is influenced more by politics and less by the law. If Prof. Gidu is right in his submissions, then the country is in a bad place. And because we are not privy to the theory relied upon by the DPP, the CID, and the courts, we refuse to comment on the IEBC ruling. Now we will turn to something more important. We will announce to the country that NASA is dead and that it died on April 27th when ODM swallowed it. What we have today is ODM reloaded, masquerading as NASA. Consider why. This is why we think NASA was swallowed by ODM. For starters, if indeed NASA is alive and well, why is it cannibalizing itself? If all is well in NASA, why would Ryla sponsor an ODM candidate against Watangula, his long-term friend? Is this normal? What about the other principles? Why is Ryla campaigning alone? Where is the so-called NASA Pentagon? And where is Isaac Ruto? Where did he go? Is NASA dead or alive in Bomet? Let us summon the evidence. What is happening? What is happening? What is happening? What is our point here? Maybe NASA died and they did not send us the memo. Or maybe NASA died because it is broke. And this is why they are fundraising from peasants with no unga. Or maybe ODM swallowed NASA and the country was not told. In sum, we are beginning to entertain the thought that maybe NASA was a cruel ODM joke on Kalonzo and Wetangula. That it was nothing but the ODM wolf clothed in NASA sheepskin. If NASA is dead and ODM is masquerading as NASA, then we must borrow from the Chinese war master General Sun Tzu to explain this paradox. In his book, The Art of War, Sun Tzu taught us about the Tao of Paradox. He taught us how to fake it in order to win. He taught us that if you are winning, you must appear like you are losing. If weak, you must appear strong. If executing a scheme, you must appear harmless. And this is what Ryla is doing. Because ODM is a political wolf, Ryla has borrowed a sheepskin called NASA. This way, he can eat the NASA sheep, including Watangula, by pretending to be a sheep himself, although really he is a wolf. But this is not where the brilliance lies. Ryla has used the Tower of Paradox on Uhuru very effectively. Because he believes he is winning, he has created the impression that he is losing. And this explains Ryla's attacks on IEBC, including the war on ballot papers. In our view, this is all a decoy. It is a diversion, and Uhuru has bought it. Ryla is playing reverse psychology on Uhuru. This is a game in which you say one thing, but you mean another. For instance, Raila has told us that Uhuru will rig this election. But it is possible that Raila is saying this because he plans to rig himself. And by putting the spotlight on Uhuru, he is taking away the attention from himself. This way, he can rig without anyone noticing it. And the Court of Appeal ruling of Friday has not helped. In fact, it gives Raila license to rig. And Kregler also told us that Raila could have rigged in the 2007 election, so he has the competences to do so. But number two, Raila has given us the impression that he is not prepared for this election. And this is why he is doing everything possible to stop it through court cases. And I say that this is nothing but 
political nonsense because Raila is more prepared for this election than any other election in his entire lifetime. But to cover up his preparedness, he is using diversionary tactics. And court cases are an example. So if fighting IBC is diversionary, what is Raila's main game plan? To be honest, I have no idea. All I know from his utterances is that violence will be part of the plan. Dear countrymen, this week Raila spoke in Kajado. He told the Maasai's not to sell their land to some people he did not name. But these people are apparently known. Immediately after, the reports of leaflets warning some communities to leave Kajado before August 8th. Then he moved to Naivasha. There he preached more divisionism. He claimed that IDPs from a particular community were paid 400,000 each and resettled. And those disliked by government are still in camps. He also claimed that the government does not employ lawyers in other communities. It only employs people from communities he did not mention. In our view, this is not propaganda. It is not a lie either. These are drums of war. With his rhetoric, Raila is setting up one part of the country against another part. And this is how the 41 versus 1 logic started in 2007. It started as Kitenda Willy jokes, and before we realized it, it had become the logic behind the civil war. The question to country is therefore this. Should we allow Raila to get away with these drums of war? From Raila's utterances, he is obviously preaching war. And he's doing it deliberately, but hiding behind vague and deniable utterances. Yet, it is clear to all what he is doing. The question we pose, therefore, is this. Should we allow him to get away with it? And the answer to this is a resounding yes. We should allow Raila to preach war. In fact, he should be made an evangelist of war. He should also be encouraged to beat the drums of war until his thumbs are sore. This way, he will reveal his true self without restraint. If we constrain his appetite for war now, he will go underground later. And this is why the truth behind the 2007 violence remains a mystery. Uhuru tells us that Raila was behind the violence, and yet the man they arrested in ODM was William Ruto. And this is because we did not give Raila enough time to show us his true colors. This year, however, we must not stop him too early. We must let the real Raila stand up. And the Kajado utterances are just the starting point. And now, a final thought for William Ruto. Traditionally, every Kenyan man has two scapegoats. If he cannot blame his woman for all his failures, he will blame the government. And when he cannot blame the government, he will blame his woman. But there is a new development. William Ruto has become the third scapegoat. Every failed politician is blaming Ruto for their failure. The politically incompetent politicians in central Kenya and Rift Valley, as well as the politically impotent fellows like Kalonzo Musioka, are blaming Ruto for their natural diseases. But our fifth estate message to William Ruto is this, Ka Ngumu. What our Swahili brothers taught us is that if a tree has no fruit, it will not attract stone throwers. Ruto has a crowd of stone throwers because he delivers. And this is why he must stop Raila. In the 2007 election, Ruto worked closely with Raila. He knew how the tension was built to the level we experienced. If this is factual, William Ruto is a man to stop Raila Odinga. He is a man to stop the coming violence. 
and he should do this for country amen